Well, hello, Achroiso. It's a great pleasure to be able to welcome you to this fourth podcast on the series that we're organising in the Church in Wales <clears throat> to consider and reflect upon the report of the Doctrinal Commission, Faithful Stewards in a Changing Church. I'm Gregory Cameron and I'm the Bishop of St. Asaph and I hold the portfolio for Faith, Order and Unity Matters in the Church of Wales. So I've been working with the Doctrinal Commission for some time now as they conceived this report and drew it together. And I'm delighted to be joined by two of the authors of this significant piece of work, two authors who contributed to the fourth section, which we'll be discussing as the report moves beyond a consideration of the historic threefold order to ask how that theological discussion applies to our own context in Wales and in the light of the 2020 vision process sparked off by the Harris Report. And so I've got with me uh, the Reverend Dr. Manon Caridwin James, uh, who works at St. Paddens Institute, and the Reverend Dr. Rhiannon Johnson, uh, who is a priest in St. David's Diocese, and also a member, as I've said, of the Doctrinal Commission. Uh, Manon, you, you've got the first chapter in the section that we're looking at in this particular uh, webinar or podcast, whatever we, we call it. And you were asked to address Welsh culture. And you said that you wanted to talk about people and praise. And you began by talking about the interface between poetry and worship. Do you see these two uh, phenomena as uh, closely linked? Um, well, yes, I think what I'm arguing in this chapter is that a lot of our liturgy and in fact the Bible is poetry. And um, I've got a quote in by Mark Oakley, who suggests that the God is a poet because of the prevalence of poetry in, in the Bible, particularly. Um, and I suppose um, I didn't, I wasn't asked necessarily to write a contextual theology of priesthood. I actually insisted that I wanted to write a contextual theology of priesthood from a Welsh perspective. And um, in my research, I found out that um, Canon Donald Olchin, whom many of us remember, uh, wrote this wonderful book about uh, the Welsh tradition. And he, he was arguing very strongly that in the Welsh tradition, in the literature, there is a strong sense of praise throughout, um, throughout our, our, our literature. Um, and it's very deeply embedded in the Welsh kind of religious psyche. So, so I was trying to bring some of those things together in this chapter. And if you were to um, be talking to young clergy, and you do in your work in St. Paddens, those who were training for the priesthood, how would you encourage them to be poets? Well, um, in lots of different ways. So uh, whenever, if I get the opportunity to run a quiet day or something, then I will always uh, use poetry as a, as a springboard. Um, people in training know that I'm very keen on poetry. I suppose I do bang on about it a bit. So that's one way in which I encourage people. But I also think that and I, I try and argue this in the chapter, we often think, and we can think of poetry as quite a rarefied pursuit, but it's not particularly rarefied in Welsh culture. It is something that ordinary people do. So I think one of the ways we can encourage um, ordinary people across Wales to involve themselves in poetry is, is to just have a go and not think of it as something that's particularly grand or high culture, but as, as an ordinary language that all of us can access. It's a different kind of language, isn't it? It's metaphoric language, it's playful language, but it's still language that I think most of us can access. Mm. Uh, it's interesting that you say that poetry should be something that 
ordinary folk do, uh, because one of the things that your essay is very strong about is the egalitarian nature of Welsh society, uh, that Welsh people instinctively don't respond uh, terribly well to hierarchies. And uh, that's a point that you make very powerfully in, in your piece. Uh, you talk about uh, the dislike in, in, in Welsh culture of the kettle blind, the, the horse out in front. And how do you think that affects patterns of ministry in the church in Wales? Well, I think it does call us to exercise ministry in slightly different ways. And uh, and again, I think the point I was trying to make is not that we're not um, hierarchical or that we don't have status in Wales. Obviously, we do, don't, don't we? Um, but we don't like to think of ourselves as people who have status. And obviously, we don't have the same class system as as we might do in, the, in England, say, or in other parts of the UK. But I think we do tend to stratify ourselves in different ways, but and we tend to get status in different ways. But that's not to say that um, that we don't believe in inequality um, very strongly. So, uh, it, you know, the, um, I'm sure that many priests in the Church in Wales going to do a funeral, for example, one of the first things somebody might say about somebody who's just died is they treated everybody the same. Um, I used to hear that quite a lot when I used to do funerals. You know, that, that was a really strong held value that people had that we didn't treat people differently depending on their status. And it, I think in terms of ministry, it is a call for us to sit lightly to, to status um, and to, well, it, you know, to exercise servant ministry um, and to think think about what that might mean in, in practice. Um, but you know, as well as I do, that there are people who kind of pay lip service to that. Um, I, I remember when, when I was a student and I, I was on a mission in Northern Ireland and the the um, person who was running the mission, you know, would very um, self-consciously um, wash the dishes one day and he was there, you know, with his tea towel, oh, look, I'm exercising um, servant's ministry. I think there's a way of doing it, which is quite ostentatious, actually. <laughs> but um, I think there's a way of, well, it, it, you know, I, 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 I feel um, myself that a continual call to, um, well, to Christian maturity, isn't it, really? And to how, how am I being in, in this, this situation? Um, but I think there is a call for all of us, really, to think through, well, what does it actually mean to, to, to be fellow followers of, of Christ in this situation? And, and I think Rhiannon's other paper in, in this, um, in the what do we call it, the report? Um, report yeah. uh, yes, you know, that we're fellow slaves in the household. So so what does that mean in practice from day to day? I think I think for all of us, it's a call to, to humility and authenticity, isn't it? And it's up to all of us to find out what that means for ourselves. Because the Harris report was quite critical of the Church of Wales, finding it overly deferential and that uh, those in positions of power or responsibility were perhaps not challenged in the way they should be. Um, again, if you were speaking to those in ordained ministry, um, what would you say to them about their style? Well, again, I think it's very hard. So um, I've I've done different kinds of ministry um, in in my I think it'll be twenty seven years now, and I think in each of those places people have tried to put me in a certain position, and and I think you get formed. You know, my role is is for formation uh, for ministry, but I think each situation we're in forms us. So if we're so used to being the person who gets the last word in a PCC and whatever we say goes then it's very difficult then, isn't it, to not be formed by that and think that we should have the last word. Um, so I think it's a call for all of us, uh, well, for people who are not the ultimate leader to challenge and for the people who are the ultimate leader in any situation to really work hard to get, to actually do collaborative ministry. Um, 
I, I don't know if you're aware, but Stephen Adams has been working on a PhD about collaborative ministry and has just uh, he received it about a year or two ago. And, and his research was that even though in the churches in the UK, we talk about collaborative ministry and have done for decades, we don't seem to be able to practice it. And um, I think it's incumbent on all of us. So it's not just the ultimate leader, a bishop or a, or a vicar who needs to practice it. We need to encourage ourselves, each other, to be collaborative and to challenge gently when we need to. Thank you. There's one final question I wanted to ask you, <clears throat> because there was a point in your essay when uh, I think the chair of the Doctrinal Commission had challenged you and said, you know, does this mean that you can find God equally in the commercial space, in an industrial space, and in the beauty of the the Welsh countryside, and you wanted to give a very definite answer to that question. Yes, so so towards the end of the, of the chapter, I argue that uh, in Wales, well, you know, it's not uniquely Welsh, but certainly in Wales, we have a very strong sense of place, and that place is really important to us. And then the question came back, well, is every place equally where we can find God? And I suppose I would think that's the wrong question to ask, because... The answer is, of course, you know, so so I think what I try and say in the chapter, it's not particularly Welsh to ask that question, because, of course, you can find God everywhere. And, uh, you know, I personally feel that even our industrial landscapes are beautiful. Um, and, uh, you know, as the vicar of, of Bethesda and the surrounding villages for seven years, you know, the slag heaps of, of Bethesda are beautiful. Um, the mountains that are beautiful just because something is industrialized um and to be honest with you you know i'm a great shopper i love shopping as well so you know do i find god in primark well i don't not find god in primark um so i would want to push back and say that question i find confusing because of course you can find god everywhere there's no question about that that's, that's great. Um, we've been chatting a bit of time. We ought to uh, think about Rhiannon's paper uh, as well. And Rhiannon, the context about which you spoke, of course, was the Church in Wales, but you were particularly looking at the challenges thrown up by the Harris Report and 2020 vision. Uh, what were your motives in producing the paper that you did for the Doctrinal Commission? Well, I'm a cleric, I'm the wife of a cleric, I'm the daughter of a cleric, and an awful lot of my friends, sadly, also wear clerical collars. Um, and I could see that the changes were causing a great deal of confusion, stress and pain, and a very deep need to reassess things that people had taken for granted about themselves and their ministry. And that kind of identity change is never easy. And actually, I came to believe that there was a triple strain on, on the, the people going through it, in particularly the stipendiaries, who had, um, who had to be the primary agents of that change, explain it, advocate for it. But were also the people who we're being blamed for the need of it, you know, we're failing as a church and therefore you as the public face of that church are branding yourself a failure. And then thirdly, um, they, they were the people whose identity was having to change most at that point in the process. Now there are other losers as well as huge gainers in the process and a lot of the clergy gain in the process as well. But it, that paper captures a particular moment of um, perhaps angst among people I was living and working with at the time, and myself. Mm. And uh, could you sort of set out, um, if people can read the chapter and uh, you, you write very eloquently and clearly, but could you set out again what you saw as the major challenges of that moment as you've described it? Mm -hmm. And I will, will want to add that the moment comes differently in different dioceses because we've all 
uh, applied the process in slightly different ways. And some are now well through it and onto a completely different set of challenges and others are still there and others haven't got there yet. So, um, well, I listened very carefully to what people around me were saying and weren't saying. And there seemed to be five particular complaints that were coming up, variously phrased. But you'd hear things like, I wasn't trained or I wasn't called to be a manager, which was a feeling that somehow the pastoral role had been hugely important to these priests' self-identity. And the nature of that pastoral role was changing um, to become more of an empowerer and a facilitator. And they feared the loss of that pastoral role and the, the identity that went along with it. So that was one of them. Another one was, well, who do I belong to? If I'm part of this big ministry or mission area, I've got used to saying, I'm the vicar of this place, or this is these are my villages, these are my people. How do I link my identity to, to a much bigger unit that really only exists in clerical paper? Because, you know, this in my case, this group of 22 parishes, it's only a group of 22 parishes. You know, it's not a county, it's not anything else. It's a group of 22 parishes. So that was another one. Another um, complaint or, or um, niggle was people saying, I don't want to go back to being someone else's curate because the only model really of um, team working we've had in the church in Wales in recent years has been a single cleric with a single curate and a worry that these teams would effectively make um, clerics who'd been on equal status suddenly one the incumbent equivalent and another the curate equivalent. And for some, it would be felt as a demotion and what was the matter with them that all of that. So you can see how that caused a whole lot of problems for people. Um, another um, one of these niggles came up about being a proper priest. Um, my big project for the last 10 years in this diocese has really been embedding a form of ministry that's very local, very contextualized, maybe sometimes called NSML and all the rest of it. And it is in some ways a threat to stipendary ministry because as um, Russell said years ago, the one thing a profession can't stand is the, is the idea that someone else can do it as a hobby. So, um, you know, that's putting it very crudely, but that was the understanding. And you'd hear a long time saying, yeah, but they're not proper priests. And so I, and what it was, was a worry, I think, very deeply about what made a proper priest and would all the changes somehow undermine these stipendiaries' identities as proper priests. And then the final one was people would get into a corner and say, yes, well, it's all very well, all this team working, but it takes so long. The problem is Father knew best, got things done quickly. Um, so I've basically told you the whole essay now. I'm sorry to have such a long answer for such a short question, but those were the sort of niggles I was hearing and the things I was doing. And, and were you able to articulate a response to those uh, worries or did you not see your essay really as having to do that? Firstly, I wanted to surface the worries and give them serious consideration because I think it's too easy to just dismiss them as niggles when actually you're asking people to make a very profound shift of self-identity, of self-understanding. And so you've got to take seriously the pain involved in that process and the difficulty of that process. But um, I found some help in a Church of England report by Peyton and Gattrell called Managing Clergy Lives. It wasn't about the change we were making, but it talked about um, the sacrificial marginality, they call it, which is quite a thing to get your tongue around, involved in clerical life. Um, that it is a different kind of life, that often your best friends don't understand quite the pressures that are on your life. And it can cause all kinds of problems. And so they talked to a, a group of people they considered clergy survivors, 
for one reason or another, long-term ministers who were keeping their heads above water and tried to find out what made them survive. And one of the very clear answers they came up with was a self-understanding about the <sighs> clergy life as a life of sacrifice. And I'm getting nervous here because this is not language that sits very easily for me because I've seen it too easily become sadistic. Mm. But, um, you know, giving your life as a living sacrifice um, and you know, lots of biblical and liturgical precedent for that kind of language. But they wanted to state very clearly that clerics give their lives as a living sacrifice to God, not to their parishioners, not to the church as an organization particularly. And so they would argue that helping clergy um, navigate these difficult changes of identity, what you have to do is show, is accept that this will involve a sacrifice and show why this is a necessary sacrifice, why it's for the greater good, why if we're all slaves in the household of God, this is the work of the household. And so this is what you have to do it's going to be tough. We'll support you as you do it. But but you have to, if you like, keep the task very clearly in mind um, in order to, well, to prevent that um, understanding of sacrifice being looked on as worthless or foolish and the clergy feeling you know, why on earth have I done all of this? I hope that makes sense. So. It, it makes a lot of sense. Although, you know, one of the things that's very striking in your essay is the use of the term slave. Uh, mm. Manon, to refer to it, you've mm. just referenced it yourself. A slave in the household of God. Mm. It doesn't sound terribly appetising. And yet many people would say priesthood is about fulfilment. Is that that? The problem is, is if you say the priesthood is about personal fulfillment, you risk getting into a whole lot of very dodgy um, pastoral areas where, where clergy are doing things to get their thrill out of it, irrespective of the person they're serving. And that's not good pastoral care. That's a form of abuse. So what you, um, yes, of course, we all get something out of the work we do. And God is good and blesses us. But the primary motivation is not, I'm doing this to show I'm a good person, or I'm doing this because it makes me feel good. The primary motivation is we're doing it to serve our Lord and Saviour. We believe that this is his will for the world around us. But um, I think you're right in saying the slave image is unappetizing, particularly in the modern world, particularly with, particularly with things that have happened in the last year that have surfaced the horrible legacy in racism that slavery has left in our society. Roman slavery was a little different. It was still bitter and hard, but the slavery at the time of Jesus, at the time the New Testament was written, was being brought into a large household of many slaves, generally, all of whom were in exactly the same relationship to the master, and all of whom were working on the business of the household. And these slaves called themselves family. They would call each other brother, sister um, in the kind of the language, the language of children and parent would be used between them and the master. Now, I'm not saying that these that there weren't terrible examples of masters, but as a slave, the quality of your life hugely depends on the quality of your master. And Paul is very, very happy to borrow the language of slavery to talk about the Christian community and to talk about his own, own ministry. I think because he can say we've got the best possible master, so the quality of our master um, affects the quality of our life as a servant, but also because it gets this idea of being part of the whole household, talks about the work of the whole household. We have tended terribly as a church, particularly in the last 150 years, to locate the work of the household on individuals. And um, the... Uh, latest ordinal I'm afraid is a terrible example of that because it loads the entire work of the church into the priest's vows 
and then just puts a little bit around it saying, of course, you've got to share this with other people. But that says it's your work, which you then get other people to help you with, rather than saying it's the work of the whole household. So how do we find out how what this servant can do to contribute to the life of the whole household? Um, what Where this servant rests, how this household looks after this servant, rather than this well, it's more than superhuman, it's a divine task, being located on poor, overburdened and weak and frail individuals like ourselves. Now, we've got to start drawing Manon back into the conversation, but I'm going to ask one question uh, before I leave the consideration mm -hmm. of your paper. Mm -hmm. um, all these papers originated as something which you wrote for the Doctrinal mm -hmm. Commission and to stimulate its thinking. And uh, this was, I understand, one of the earlier contributions. Uh, looking at it from the perspective of 2021, have things changed? Among the group of people whose complaints first surfaced and I crystallised, yes, it has changed. Um, I noticed a big difference in my own area between the process of forming the ministry area in which all of this surfaced. And then when the ministry area itself was formed, we just got on with it and things became a lot better. But it was that, it's all transition stuff, isn't it? It's the worry coming up to the threshold. And once you pass the threshold, once it's in some ways irreversible, then the conversation changes. I don't think the niggles have entirely gone away. And a lot in ministry areas will can be done to make sure that the way they form helps everyone involved uh, and they can be malformed very easily and not help anyone involved. So that's one thing. Then we've had the pandemic and um, it was really interested me in the beginning of the pandemic that I was getting a lot of jokes on my computer saying, calling it an apocalypse, you know, who knew my apocalypse outfit would be pyjamas, that kind of silly joke. But of course, an apocalypse is a revealing, a revelation. And it seems to me in clergy terms that what it's actually done is revealed a lot of our underlying assumptions. Um, where ministry areas or mission areas have been strong, they've worked together as a mission area. Where they've been weak, everyone's gone off and done their own things. Um, and so that that has revealed an awful lot about them. It's also revealed a lot about how some clergy talking the language of collaboration of being slaves in the household, but have ended up ev doing everything themselves um, or feeling they ought to do themselves. And some of them feeling very, very useless and marginal because the things that gave them a sense of identity suddenly had to stop. Um, but that would be a completely different paper. So, um, but it was, I did find it interesting. Yes, well, thank you very much. And uh, I found both of the papers very enriching. Could I uh, sort of start to identify, I think, some of the common themes? Uh, Rhiannon, you talked about how priests are reluctant to be managers because they feel called to be pastors and Manon in your paper you you do a sharp, sharp distinction between uh, the priest as president someone who uh, lords it over the congregation and presider one who gathers the people uh, in a in a literally a shepherding pastoral role um, could you both reflect for me, uh, perhaps Manon first and then Rhiannon, on, on what you see as the significance of the pastoral role going forward? Well, I think that's a really good question. And um, so I think in, in my time in ministry, I've seen the pastoral role change enormously. So uh, when I was a curate, I would do the kind of visiting, you know, I'd have a visiting list in the afternoon. I'd, um, I'd go and see three, four, five people every afternoon. Uh, we had a list of home communions. And it, the, 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 this was in Llandidno. Um, and that was my job as, as a curate was, was to visit people's homes. 
Um, by the time I'd, I'd um, become an incumbent, um, I was the vicar in a place where there had only been one vicar, one church, and uh, became a vicar of, of three churches that had never been together before. So th the job had just tripled in, in workload. And it wasn't possible to, to do the, that same amount of visiting that, that I think I'd thought was my job or I'd been trained for maybe. Um, and then my job suddenly became about empowering and working with other people and developing them in their pastoral ministry and also trying to work with the congregation to see themselves as, as, um, as their role was loving their neighbours rather than me being the person who did all the pastoring. And then in, in my last incumbency, that was definitely the case. Um, I, I don't think I hardly ever visited anybody in their homes. Um, the visiting I did was about baptisms and funerals. Otherwise, it was really about empowering the congregation and um, developing lay ministries and developing teams. And um, I would take orders from our pastoral assistants in one church where to go. It wouldn't be me delegating my work to her. It would be her saying, right, we need to go and do this now and we would do it together. So um, I think I think the role, whether it's, I would think that some people would find it unwelcome, but I still think that, I still think historically and in terms of biblically from the beginning of the Christian church, our role has always been to serve the community and to serve the people we're living amongst, to love our neighbor. Um, so I don't think we've landed yet uh, in terms of what the pastoral role of the priest is now. I think we're still in, in a state of flux, but I think I think it's about it's half and half, isn't it? It's like you know the old Welsh thing, you know, ch ch chips and rice. I'll have half and half. I think it's it's sort of you do a little bit of in one to one pastoring yourself. Um, so I I I think in you know in terms of what I'm arguing elsewhere, it would be wrong if the priest was creaming off all the important pastoral work or the interesting pastoral work and just developing other people there would be something wrong in that I think there always needs to be a a bit of a jobbing nature to a priest you know kind of getting stuck in with everyone else but but I think primarily and I think this should have always have been our role it is to enliven and encourage communities to to love and to serve and is that something uh, you'd also recognise, Rhiannon? Yes. Um, I mean, Manon's history and ministry, I could see a lot of parallels with my own development in ministry as we've gone along. <coughs> For me, I think I'd want to just think a little about what belongs to our ministry as the baptised, as people of God. And then what belongs to our ministry as priests, because we're all of us called to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our souls and with all our strength and our neighbours as ourselves. All of us. The parable of the sheep and the goats doesn't say, but you with collars, you're going to do this, you're going to do that or the equivalent. All of us have to account before the throne of judgment for, for whether we helped those in need or whether we didn't. So... I'm quite happy to take on bits of pastoral work wherever I am and to behave pastorally because that's my calling as a Christian. But I suppose what I would see my calling as a priest is first of all, not to get in the way of other Christians doing it because then I would, then I would have got in front of them and the sheep and the goats that I'd be getting in, in the way of what they need to do as Christians. Um, so I don't want to disempower other people but also as a priest, I think the call is to the community, to the group, as Manon says, to, to the health of that as a group. Now, there are lots of ways that group can be healthy and can be growing and can best use its resources. But the role of the priest, I don't want to use the shepherding language because it turns everyone else into sheep, but perhaps in a, one of these households, you do have slaves whose role it is to, to help the other slaves to flourish in the work they do, 
to make sure they're not overburdened, to make sure they're cared for, to make sure that no one gets forgotten. And it seems to be a vital pastoral task that needs to happen in every Christian community. There needs to be someone there to focus that community. It could be the priest, or you could, in some very small churches, have other people who do that focal ministry because the priest has to, is needed as the sacramental minister. And that's just the way it works out in the, the deep countryside. But we do need to start thinking about the good of the group as well as the group of individuals. Individualism has done horrible things to us as a church. And we're just coming off the toxic of it and um, going through withdrawal from individualism. That's a, a very interesting theme because I, I think, again, a, a lot of what the whole report uh, indicates is this shift from the individual carrying the burden of ministry towards us recognising this is the ministry of the church and how do we empower the whole people of God. And uh, it can be quite difficult sometimes yes. to, to let go and enable others. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, thank you very much. Um, and I very much hope none of my parish are watching this because they are probably laughing behind their hands as I say all this. So, um, so perhaps, there we go. It's a difficult job. Well, we always say, don't we, that the good uh, preacher preaches first to themselves um, <laughs> because we have to learn the lessons we want to preach. Um, was it an interesting time on the Doctrinal Commission as you were listening to these papers and having to respond to each other's papers? I, I wondered whether I could ask either of you to, to talk about how what you've responded to in the other's paper. What was there about Welsh culture, Rhiannon, in Manon's paper that you thought, yes, this is touching something very important? Or what was there in Rhiannon's analysis, Manon, that you said, yeah, that's a Rhiannon's put her finger on something here? Uh, I'll leave it to you to decide where uh. to go through. It's always a pleasure to read Manon's work and um, a deep pleasure when she's quoting Iris Bowen and all the rest of these and, and I'm loving the poetry and enjoying it. But this idea of the priest poet, um, I found deeply fascinating. Um, partly because of course, you see what a poet has to do is see and make connections and if we're trying to think what is unique about priesthood in the community, what, what the priesthood does for the community, that seeing and making connections seems to me um, a vital role. And of course, a poet makes them, makes huge connections, sometimes ridiculous connections, but, but they try and they, um, they're constantly knitting together all these things that are happening. That would seem to me a, a beautiful and very challenging and very slightly off the wall definition of priesthood, but a wonderful one. Um, so I've got an awful lot of from that. And then some finding some poetry I didn't know before, which is always a gift. So I'm very grateful to Manon for that paper. I really enjoy. And I, I must admit, I, I enjoyed the poetry of Manon's paper as well. And um, there was that lovely poem by Mena Elvin, uh, which I feel I have to quote in this seminar, because I think all of us have known the situation where uh, the men somehow assume that the women will make the tea afterwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mena catches this beautifully uh, with her poem. And I haven't read the original in Welsh, sadly. Will the ladies please stay behind? Mm -hmm. uh, and that magnificent uh, response of the women to the elders in the chapel, I think, those who sat in a saith vowel. Um, Listen here, little masters, if Christ came back today, he'd definitely be making his own cup of tea. <laughs> and uh, uh, that was so splendid, I think, uh, man. And it's, um, uh, is, that, is that true? Uh, are we... Uh, becoming a church which is being faithful to equality? 
Well, well, we are now, aren't we? So um, I can't remember when the poem was written, probably about 20, 30 years ago by now. And, and in the Welsh speaking world, I've heard people say, we wouldn't dream of now saying, will the ladies stay behind? Um, because we know the poem and, and we've heard the poem and it's really challenged us in terms of, of our language about men and women in church. So um, when I did my PhD a couple of years ago, uh, the um, the women I interviewed really did have these experiences of being expected to do certain things in church because they were female and men being able, you know, having to do other other work. So, so one of my interviewees said that she wasn't allowed to do the parking to, um, at an event because she was female. Now, I think I think we're sort of moving on from that, but we're not totally out of the woods. So, so I think. I think um, to go back to a conversation we were having about the sacrifice, actually, I think an interesting thing is that the different generations have different takes on on this sort of language. So I think, you know, would we call them the baby boomers? You know, they're very comfortable talking about duty and sacrifice. Um, ge Generation X, less so. Uh, millennials, not at all. You know, they just don't understand what what that language means and I find that in the church there are different generations of people in the church some of whom will talk very happily about obedience and sacrifice and are very shocked and disturbed that that you know generations below them are uncomfortable about this so mm -hmm. so I I found that what Srianan said in her paper really fascinating on that um and I find that in my work you see that um we might ask uh, you know, bishops, or we might ask archdeacons, um, what would they like to see in our training? And and we will hear back, oh, you know, we we need to hear more about obedience and sacrifice. Um, so I think what Rhiannon was saying, that actually people find it quite stressful to be reminded of this, mm. but actually the other side of the coin is, it's not sacrifice to the institution, is it? It's sacrificed to God. So I thought that was a, a really, really important point. Yes. Um, and the other thing I picked up in Shannon's paper, which I, I think needs, you know, it would take a whole new webinar, is this, I was ordained to be a priest, not a manager. I just think that that's so rich. There's loads to, to, to discuss there because mm. in many ways, there are some management techniques that we've incorporated in the church. There are things though that we could critique theologically in how our parishioners have to operate in the workplace, you know, because of management structures and things like that. So I don't think it's an either or. I think I think there's loads to to talk about in terms of working practices. It's yeah, I found it very interesting <clears throat> earlier when when Rhiannon was uh, offering a critique of the word shepherding because. The danger was then that you, you divide the church into the people who were the shepherds and the others who were the sheep who were expected to be corralled or <laughs> I suppose you might even say fleeced on occasion. Um, these are dangerous images. But there is a sense in which uh, the priest is called to give the church shape, to, to create a space in which the, the flock may flourish, not because they're subservient, but because they're being given the opportunity to become like the master and to carry forward the mission of the master. Um, and, and again, like yourself, man, and I think uh, uh, Rhiannon offered a very helpful corrective when she talks about we serve the best of of masters. It's, it's not about serving the bishop, much as I'm tempted to say otherwise, of course, in my role. It's not about that. It's about serving the Lord and allowing the ministry of God's love to the world to be instanced by the people of God and reflected by the people of God. Um, we're in 2021 and uh, the life of the Church in Wales moves onward. 2020 vision uh, is already out of date, as it were. Uh, reflecting on the particular context of your papers, uh, the people who listen to this 
podcast. What would you want to say to them about their ministry, be it ordained or lay? Can we just turn to the future and uh, speak directly to the heart of the people and priests of the Church in Wales? You could go first, madam. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I was um, I was listening to a well, I didn't actually listen to the whole thing, but but a TED talk flashed up on my screen um, on Facebook, and it was the story of um, a head teacher who turned around a failing school, and you know this is her kind of thing that she goes to schools that are in trouble and, and changes them and completely overturns them and makes them successful schools, and what she um, what she said was that her secret was loving the pupils and loving the teachers and I just thought wow that, that was so simple but um, I think and I, I think what I've tried to, to talk about in, in the chapter really is that there's nothing new under the sun isn't there so this idea of us loving our landscape and loving our people you know it's as old as as anything within Christianity isn't it it's what we're called to do what we've always been called to do but but I think in terms of um, our calling. So for for clergy, you know, I think Rhiannon has shown beautifully how um, we we tend to be quite obsessed and concerned about our own status, which is completely wrong, isn't it? Because that's the last thing we, we're called to be the opposite of that. But whenever any whenever anybody feels threatened or a group of people feel threatened, we go into our identity huddles, don't we, and worry about it. But but this kind of calling to love. And um, which has always been our calling, um, but to, to love our communities, to love our people, to love the people we serve. And then for people, uh, for people who are not clergy, but who um, are involved in our parishes and in lay ministry or not lay ministry, I think it's a calling to love, isn't it? Calling to love people we work with, the parents we come across on the school gate, just, just to love others in our everyday lives. Um, can I just finish with one thing as well? That, that uh, the thing that's really struck me in the last couple of years is the work that they've done in the Church of England on um, on uh, calling, and this kind of phrase. You know, the ninety five percent of of people. I forget the name of the of the initiative, but the ninety five percent of people in our churches who haven't got a badge or a title or a special clothes or anything, but they're the kind of heartbeat of everything we do. And anybody who has a, a title or a or a special clothes or anything, our job is to serve them in order to enable them to be the church. Um, and somehow we've kind of turned that upside down. So, so I think I'd want to end with a kind of a call really for all of us to really respect and value the ministry and discipleship of most of the people in our churches and to, and to remember that, that if we have a job or role or a title, our role is to enable them to be the people of God and to serve them. Thank you very much, Manon. Uh, Shannon, what about yourself? What I'd like to say is quite simple, but it'll take a bit of complex to get there. Um, and the bit of complex is, I think, in all the research I was doing on priesthood, the one book that blew me away was Graham Tomlin's The Widening Circle. And it talks about Christ's priesthood, Christ's ministry of perfecting the world of um, interceding for the world of loving and bringing it to goodness and fulfillment in himself. And then Graham Topman talks about that love widening through the church and the church does that for humanity and humanity does that for the whole of creation. So my, what I would like to say to the people listening to it, other than thank you, you poor things and well done for sticking this long is say, we can argue all we like about definitions of ministry, and we will because it's important to us, but it's never more important than looking out and seeing that this is God's world. And as a church, and just as human beings, we have a responsibility, as Manon says, to love it, to work for its flourishing, 
and to see it caught up in praise. And that's, that's our work. And how we um, partial that work out will change and we'll debate about it, but it doesn't stop the importance of our work. Well, well, thank you very much. Thank you both for your chapters and your contributions to the report, uh, Faithful Stewards in a Changing Church. And thank you very much for your discussion today and our chance to look at the Welsh context and the context of the changing church. Um, you've ended on, I think, the most important note, and that is that God's love is revealed in Jesus Christ and we're called to be caught up in that movement of love to the world. Uh, that love is a deliberate act in the Christian faith of saying, how may I be of service? How may I widen the circle of God's love? On that note, we probably ought to draw things to a close, but uh, we're not finished quite yet uh, because we uh, are inviting those who watch this podcast to join for a live conversation when they may start talking to us about the points that have been raised and responding to the report for themselves. And the uh, Zoom conversation, uh, which uh, will relate to this particular section of the report, is going to be on Monday the 7th of June at 7 p.m. And uh, if you'd like to come along to that discussion, and we'd love to see you there and uh, to have you cross-examine us, uh, registration details are available on the Faithful Stewards section of the provincial website. So do look it up there, and we'll look forward to continuing this discussion uh, at that Zoom conversation, Monday the 7th of June at 7 p.m. Uh, there's another podcast coming up, and that is for the Welsh speakers. Uh, I'm glad and proud that we live in a bilingual church, and uh, we do have uh, a Welsh seminar uh, coming up, uh, a Welsh podcast. Bydd cyfle i chwilio thi mae'r adroddiad gorichwyrwyr ffodlon, have I said that correctly? Uh, gorichwyrwyr chwilwyr ffodlon, <laughs> ond gymni esgob andi o fangor, gydy, gyda'r alodau Cymru Cymraeg Commission a thraw iaithol, uh, parchedig Dr. Manon Caredwin James, uh, gyda ni heddw, uh, a pachedig danun Dr. Tristan Owen Hughes, ar pachedig Dr. Ainsley Griffiths. Bydd y video a gael erbyn canol mis nesaf, a gallwch a'i wylio drwy adran gorichwylwyr ffodlon ar wefan dalaithiol yr eglis yn Gymru. Yno gallwch hefyd gofestru a gyfer a alwed Zoom fyw, a can helir nos lin er inved ar higen o fe hefin am saith o gloch. Cofiwch y minw ar ni a gyfer y digwyddiad hwn os gwelch yn dda. So those are my advertisements for uh, forthcoming engagement with uh, faithful stewards. But I'd like to invite all the church to engage with this uh, important report. Um, the authors are rightly proud of their work and, uh, and we've enjoyed engaging with them today. But already the reaction we're getting to the report more widely by those who have read it is that they found it both challenging and helpful for their understanding of ministry in the church and the challenges and way ahead for the church in Wales. Uh, on the website that I've already referred to, you'll find editions of the report, not only the report itself, but also a study edition, which asks questions, reflects upon the text and invites you to enter into dialogue. Well, 
as Rhiannon has said. Thank you for enduring to this point on this particular webcast. And I'd like to thank Manon and Rhiannon especially uh, for their contributions to the report and for their willingness to be uh, cross-examined and ask questions about it uh, on this occasion. Uh, I wish you all well, and I wish you every blessing, Rhiannon, uh, Manon, in your ministries and your work, and to the whole people of Wales and the Church in Wales. May we uh, widen the circle of God's love through the gifts with which Christ has empowered us. Uh, every blessing, Diolch uh, Galon, Ibaub.